I'm really proud of this West Side Walking Tour because of its focus on immigration and activism in a, a neighborhood, in a city. Um, and so I think of it as a, a storytelling opportunity for visitors or for residents to discover things that maybe they didn't realize about the place that they're in, whether they live there or not, and, it, and to, again, bring them into a new awareness of the layers of history that exist in a particular place. I think that by knowing the story of a place, it connects you in a deeper way to that place. The Wedding Cake House was built around 1868 by a, a, a local architect named Perez Mason for a, an industrialist named John Kendrick. And Kendrick grew up on a farm, came from a sort of a laboring background, but he became an iron molder and worked in mill workshops, cotton mills. Uh, and in those workshops, he uh, found a way to standardize some of the equipment used on these massive power looms. And they became the primary resource for mills around the world. And so he built this house uh, at the end of Broadway as a monument to his wealth and social status. But also he and Perez Mason, the architect, and their families were very close and would spend a lot of time on Martha's Vineyard at the Wesleyan Grove Camp Meeting Ground, a Methodist church camp meeting ground that dates back to 1835. And this is where Perez Mason himself, the architect, developed this uh, gingerbread, Victorian Gothic gingerbread style. And so I can see John Kendrick asking Perez Mason, build me a house that looks like the wonderful village of gingerbread cottages that we spend our summers in. Our organization shares the connection of female leadership and entrepreneurship with the Cherokee legacy of the building. The location and history of the building as a famous site of a women-owned design business makes it an ideal project to complement our current facility, mission, and program. Our goal is to ground innovation and creative entrepreneurship in a historical context by building a site that connects the region's history of design and textile manufacturing to current practices in art and design fields. Our hope is to showcase Rhode Island as a place steeped in design thinking and visionary approaches. When we first came into the space, it was so clear just the connection to the Tarochi history and legacy um, was just too perfect. I mean, um, having an organization that supports female identified artists and having this connection to the history and the legacy of this building um, with female entrepreneurship and textile and design industry, um, it really felt as if the stars were aligning and that um, we needed to we needed to develop this space. And actually, you know, no one else was going to come in and save this building and have programming and a mission that aligned with its history. The mission of Dirt Palace Public Projects is twofold. One, to enhance the cultural life of the Olneyville neighborhood of Providence, Rhode Island, by producing public art exhibitions facilitating artist residencies, and building relationships between artists, educators, and the community at large through educational events focused on street side public displays, as well as lectures, artist talks, and workshops. And two, to create opportunities for female identified artists and other people historically marginalized within the arts. When completed, the building will house a project-based artist in residence program on the third floor that is supported by earned income from short-term rentals on the second floor. Artist talks, programming, and exhibitions will happen on the first floor. Other people coming along and being excited about it has made such a difference, and so I think that's the thing that's exciting. And seeing people, um, you know, who kind of are interested in the house also put together the pieces about kind of thinking about how women connect to it and why that's important and thinking big picture about like what it means for culture and society to have models of women and immigrants as entrepreneurs and as successful. So I think that's a and seeing like all kinds of people really resonate with those stories I think has been really cool and I think it's um, made the house, I think the house really brings a lot to kind of our project and our organization which is um, not something I think we anticipated from the outset was how many people who would generally not care about supporting women artists have really been excited about what we're doing. The Cherokee sisters 
immigrated from Guarcino, Italy in the early 1900s. Anna Tarocchi was the older sister and clearly the force in the relationship between these two sisters as they became Providence couturiers. They arrived in Providence around 1907 and they were in independent business by 1911 and had made enough money that Anna was able herself to buy the wedding cake house in 1915. And for the next 30 years, the wedding cake house was a center of Providence high fashion. I think that's why so many people are excited about the project is that there will be this public component. So unlike other projects that have um, tried to develop this space, which was separating it into four or five condos, those, or they would have been private uses. And so the fact that when we're open, people will be able to come and experience the building and that it's open to them, I think has really garnered us a lot of support. And I always get excited about unlikely people kind of crossing paths. And I think the idea of people who are interested in history, you know, crossing paths with artists and figuring out what their commonalities are, that's the kind of stuff that like, excites me as an organizer and or curator or you know th those kind of connections that happen when people who don't realize that they have things in common find themselves in common spaces or being excited by the same space or working in the same space so that's the stuff that I really look forward to. As I began to choose the locations and dig in into their history uh, the, the narrative that was unifying for all of these sites became more and more clear to me. It, they sort of revealed themselves to me, and it was one of uh, immigration and activism. So this idea of Providence being a city that has received immigrants for its entire history, starting with the English who arrived here in the 17th century, the Irish in the 19th century, the Italians, Eastern and Southern Europeans in the late 19th century, to today, Cambodian, Latin American, uh, immigrants from really all over the world continuing to arrive in and become a part of this city and transform it. And that was really visible to me on the west side. Those struggles that immigrants from earlier generations faced are not so different from the struggles that immigrants today face. And I think that the power of that story um, revealing to people the um, sort of cycle of history and that um, while we see a lot of things going on today as different, they're connected to these long traditions and, and that can give us a way to understand what's happening and how to, um, to embrace it. And I think that also what surprised me about the West Side was the um, social activism. So for instance, the, the people at the Bell Street Chapel were some of the most radical, uh, forward-thinking, progressive people of their day, of the late 19th century, embracing causes like the anti-slavery movement, the women's suffrage movement, uh, a peace movement, uh, you know, really extraordinary people who also had stories uh, to tell that, that, that complemented and were a part of this story of, of immigration. The Bell Street Chapel was built in 1875 by a well-known Providence architect, William R. Walker, for a wealthy patron, James Eddy. And Eddy had made a lot of money in the art world. He was a very skilled draftsman and artist, and he would pay people to make copies of great masterworks and bring them over here to sell at auction. He made a fortune off it. And he was also connected to some of the most radical and progressive social thinkers of the day, people of the Transcendentalist movement in Boston, some of the most radical people in the anti-slavery movement in the Northeast, and he certainly was a leading figure. And so it's interesting to think of this chapel as a monument to both his irascible, opinionated view of religion as an individual experience and the way that connects to the potential within each human being to achieve something great, to better themselves, to become a, a, the part of making a better world. So I see the Bell Street Chapel as sort of combining this, this beautiful structure with this commitment to progressivism and free thinking. The current congregation loves its history here. We're in this historic building and we know the stories of how the building was built and who built it. And 
We love this sanctuary. We like sharing it with other groups. And so we're kind of caught in the past in some ways because we like being in a historic building. I love the fact that when Anna Garland Spencer first organized this congregation, social action was at the top of their agenda. Anna Garland Spencer had been writing for the Providence Journal and she was very concerned about the children working in the mills and so she wrote articles about that. And from that time, uh, social justice issues have always been an important part of this congregation and they continue to this day to be important. Bell Street Chapel has lots of stories associated. I, I always liked that thing about if these walls could talk, what kind of stories would it tell? But being someone who likes women's history, I've been particularly interested in the stories about Anna Garland Spencer, who was the first minister. After James Eddy died, uh, he left money to maintain this church and a group of trustees were appointed to keep it going. And they hired Anna Garland Spencer to be uh, the minister and to gather a group of people to form a religious, an independent religious group here. And so eventually she was able to do that. And then she was ordained as the first women, woman minister in Rhode Island. So in 1893, uh, the Columbian Exposition was held in Chicago. It was also known as the Chicago's World Fair. Anna Garland Spencer went there. Anna's speech uh, was called The Advantages and Dangers of Organization. Look at the question as it relates to religion and charity, the first specialties of women's associated effort. An item from a society journal, which I clipped not long ago, will illustrate my thought. In the column of correspondence, the question is asked, how may I, a stranger in New York with ample means, but with no first class letters of introduction, best acquire social standing? The response of the columnist was this, hire an eligible sitting in a church frequented by people of high social influence. Join two or three popular charitable associations managed by society women. Subscribe liberally to their work and get elected if possible on their boards of directors. Comments on this seems unnecessary, but I wonder if any of us fully realize how degraded from its high uses of church and a charitable organization must become if a majority of its membership considered it only in the light of a ladder to social distinction. A lot of people come by here and they see the columns out front and they wonder what kind of place this is. And uh, we often wish that there was some way we could get them to come inside. Working on the road tour uh, gave me, again, a, a purpose to go out and reach out to the people who are in these houses and churches and historic buildings and to get to know what they're doing. I think that such an important part of the story is not just what happened 100 years ago, but what's happening today.